Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker of this afternoon, Camille Callison. Camille Callison is a member of the Taltan Nation and is the learning and organizational development librarian and a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Manitoba. Callison was on the founding board of the Canadian Federation of Library Associations, where she served as the chair of Indigenous Matters Committee, chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and is currently a copyright committee member. Callison is an Indigenous partner on the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission Task Force on Archives and a member of in the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions Indigenous Matters Section Standing Committee. She is a member of the National Film Board of Canada Indigenous Advisory Group and a member of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO Memory of the World Committee. Camila is a passionate cultural activist dedicated to the preservation of indigenous knowledge, culture, and cultural material in a variety of mediums for future generations. She contributes by actively promoting indigenous libraries, archives, cultural memory, and indigenous languages, as well as identifying and making recommendations on indigenous knowledge and the needs of indigenous peoples through involvement in local, national, inter and international professional associations. So I've had the pleasure of hearing Camille speak several times um, this past year, and I'm so delighted to have her present with us today in this context. So thank you very much. So, Madhu, um, thank you very much for having me here today, and I want to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and looking after me while I've been here. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm really honored to be a guest here in, now I just lost it again, <laughs> anyway, in, um, in uh, Mohawk territory, and I just lost the name of it because I just tried to memorize it two minutes ago. So, um, and I noticed uh, that it's not actually the way it's, it looks spelled. So that's like many of the languages from the Teltan Nation. Um, and it was so nice um, earlier today uh, to hear uh, Sherry playing some Navajo, which is a uh, Dene language. It's very similar to Teltan. Uh, so it was nice. It was almost like listening to my aunties. So very hard acts to follow. and. Um, I just wanted to say how grateful I am to be here. Currently, I reside in um, in uh, Treaty One territory um, and the heart of the Métis um, Red River homelands. And I think that um, uh, I think that part of that has really influenced um, some of the work that I've been able to do because of it being a small population province. And coming from BC, which is a bigger population, and of course we know that here in, um, in Quebec and Ontario is, is bigger, but it gives you more opportunities when you're in a small um, population province. So I'm, I've been there for seven and a half years, and, um, and uh, it's very different because, of course, there's no mountains or ocean um, in uh, Manitoba, so it's been very interesting to be in a landlocked um, uh, province, but also very wonderful, and I met some incredible people, some of which are here today. Um, so Liv is here today, and I just am happy to have her here. I do have some other colleagues, which I will be mentioning uh, later on that are here today uh, that I do work with. Um, so everybody asked me, where is Taltan territory? And I was just telling um, uh, Sarah that you say you're tall and tan. That's what the men used to always say to other women when they were flirting with them from other <laughs> nations. And because everybody in your home community you're related to, right? So you have to flirt with other people from other communities. And uh, they go, just remember us, we're tall and tan. And I never forgot that, but it's probably the easiest way to say our, our language. So originally, we would have called ourselves Teladene, uh, which means uh, the people of Teltan. Um, and our territory is um, actually shaped like raven. So uh, Tesquia is my clan. That's Crow clan. We have two clans. We're matrilineal people. Uh, Chiona is the uh, other clan. And you have to marry your opposite clan. Uh, plus, you can't marry too close. So basically, it means that there's probably nobody that I could ever really marry in my community uh, because I'm related to probably almost everybody. So my grandma is Ethel Kwok, and uh, my dad is uh, Dempsey Collison. And so um, I think that one of the things is is that we I come from one of the largest families, but also too, 
uh, because of the way our fee system works, there's um, rules that we have to follow within that. So Tuskiacho is actually Raven to us. And so Raven is a very important creator, um, who we are. And if you notice, um, because this map was done for actually for Canada, the tail feathers are in Wrangell, Alaska. So I would say that I'm from BC and up in the Yukon where you see the beak is. And... Uh, and it's 28 hours drive north of Vancouver to get to Telegraph Creek, where I'm from, and which is um, uh, in our community. So it looks like um, a raven with their beak up and their wings closed. And if you look at uh, the way the picture is, and you can imagine the tail feathers going into um, uh, to Alaska and to Wrangell, Alaska, there where the Stikine, mouth of the Stikine River is. For many of you who don't know, that is Canada's Grand Canyon, second only in size in North America to the Grand Canyon, uh, where our Dene brothers and sisters are down in Arizona. Um, so it's very important for us to um, uh, look at our land, and we say, um, and my late um, um, uh, grandpa, Robert Kwok, who was my grandma's youngest brother, um, said, would always say to me, Camille, we belong to the land. We don't own the land. We belong to the land. And I would say that wherever I am in the world, I've always, and part of me is always back home in Teltan territory. So the reason why I gave you the little bit of language lesson about what uh, uh, Tuskiacho is, is because this is a sacred place for us where the Stikine and Teltan rivers meet, and it's right up here, and it's called Tuskiacho Kima, which means uh, Tuskia is crow, Tuskia Cho is raven, so big crow, and Kima means house. And um, if you can see, this is actually the main highway, that little line that's going up the mountain in the canyon, it actually is the actual main highway into um, our territory. And that's really what it's like, you're going up the canyon walls uh, to be able to get up into the territory. So we frequently have uh, slides and they have to build dry bridges and that kind of thing to be able to get in. Uh, in 2010, we celebrated 100 years of um, us having a Teltan declaration that went to the Canadian government and went to the Queen, uh, which said that we will never and we never have ceded or surrendered our land at the cost of our own blood. We continue to exercise that. We've never treated, uh, and we say that we never will. So I come from an amazing territory where it's been so remote, uh, it's so remote. Uh, that many people didn't go there. We only had a road from the south in 71. We still have to drive eight hours to go to a grocery store. Um, so we have a small store that would be like a little bit bigger than a 7-Eleven. Uh, but if you want to go to Safeway or Save on Foods, you're, or we don't have Loblaws in BC, but uh, if you're going to someplace like that, you're driving eight hours to either north to Whitehorse or down south to um, uh, Smithers and Terrace, where my dad lives. He retired in the south, which is really the north to most of Canada. Um, <laughs> but I grew up as an outfitter's um, a daughter, so many people in our community are cowboys. Um, that's how I grew up in, uh, in really the cowboy lifestyle, um, going on the land most of the summer. In the winters, I would live in Vancouver with my mom. My, my mom and dad weren't together since I was seven. And so there's a picture of me with my horse outlaw that I... After I uh, moved to, to Winnipeg, I had to get back to my dad, to the herd, because I couldn't keep him there. I think that part of it is is just situating ourselves in who we are, who our knowledge is, and knowing our history. And I was so honoured um, the other day when the ICE program at um, University of Manitoba, I talked to them about doing academic um, uh doing an academic introduction, um, and an Indigenous in introduction, but in an academic setting. And so I gave them this lecture, and one of the things that they said is that, um, that I know where I'm from. And I remember the joke that one of the, our neighbors to the south, the Niska, said about uh, Teltans. How do you know when you meet a Teltan? And they're like, how? Because they always tell you who they are. So we do. We are very proud of who we are. We wear it on, on our wrists and on our ears and in our necklaces and in our clothing. We are very proud of who we are. And I think that that um, knowledge of who we are and our design and our clans um, has been transformed into many different medias now, whether it's um, originally we didn't have um, uh, some of the things that we do today with um, Facebook and with blogs and with other types of media, but we also uh, wore it in our traditional regalia, uh, but it's now come into a modern day thing. And I think that part of that is 
us keeping that alive and it's a living, our knowledge, our traditional knowledge, our ways of life are um, traditional, but they're also living and they're dynamic and they're going to change. They're not completely static. So historically, we had come from, um, we, had, we came from a place where many, many of our histories, and they were histories, not, um, uh, not de definitely not from a female point of view, were in libraries and archives and traditional knowledge. They played a central role, really, in preserving a lot of our Indigenous knowledge by gathering things when, at the time, it was outlawed in Canada until the 1950s to be able to continue on our way of life and our feast hall, which is really our memory places where we keep our memories and they were really our cultural memory institutions where we recounted our stories, our creation stories, where I showed you where Teskia Chokima was, which is our creation story. And part of what was happening with that is that we now, as in our in our period of, um, I think it's reactivating our knowledges in a new way and a new dynamic because we have we have my child who's um, not a child anymore. He's 35. Uh, Matthew comes from a place where he didn't have a parent who went to residential school like I did, and so our younger generations are stronger than what we are and what I am. Uh, to be able to reactivate our cultural memory and our language and our knowledge. And they're so, I think it's so beautiful because they come from a different place than what we did, where there's no intimidation to um, suppress that knowledge and we don't have to uh, uh, deal with that kind of thing anymore as much. Although we know that there's still racism that exists today and we're still fighting that battle to be able to put our histories in places where other people may think is more valued, whether it's art galleries or museums or archives or languages. And sometimes just by it being indigenous knowledge, it can get excluded or it's called folklore or it's called Indians of North America, the, the hated term for Library and Archives Canada uh, subject headings. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I think that part of that is that we are um, able to, in a different way, using social media and some of the tools that are at hand, to be able to give our knowledge to people today in a way that comes from us, uh, which we didn't have before. And I think that that's really important, that that transfer of knowledge now is sometimes coming from our younger generations who have heard it from their elders, and they're putting it into a, a format where it's being transferred to other people without a filter, which I think is incredible. Um, and I think that that really talks about that importance and dynamic um, nature of our knowledge and how it can be transformed. And I'm always reminded of a story um, that um, my late uh, great uncle, um, Pat Carlett, told um, uh, told me in the first place because he had the right to tell that story um, and he told me about the three sisters which actually aren't the three sisters they're really the three brothers but when they translated it to English they got it wrong so imagine that hey so anyway uh, we have five genders so maybe they just got confused I'm not sure uh, but anyway um, I think that one of those things is that when I was younger that story meant a certain thing to me as a young mom as I got older and my son moved out of the house and I started to be able to do things that were of, of a different nature, that story meant something else. And I was talking with one of um, our language teachers and she said, you know, when I was a young girl, that story meant this to me. When I was a teenager, it meant this. And the same thing happened for me. And that's what I talk about with the transform uh, transformative nature of our knowledge is that even if you hear that story 20 years ago, if you hear it again from an elder, different elements of it will come forward um, that are there to be able to guide you through your life. And we do belong to that, and that knowledge is living. So acknowledging that is, I think, one of the first steps that we have to take when we're working with um, preserving our knowledge, recognizing that that work is never going to be done, uh, that it's always going to be there, and we always need to keep it. And so I was so... Um, impressed by uh, when you got went there and you actually got the images again. That's incredible. And I had a little bit of techno technological wow going on there, but people um, probably don't understand how incredible that is. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but I think that uh, uh, that's so incredible that we can be, we we're able to go back and do those kind of things to be able to pull up that knowledge that sometimes was in a different format. And I'm embarrassed to say sometimes that I actually started computers um, 
uh, many, many years ago uh, in the days of DOS. And while I was in college learning computers, we actually switched to Windows. So there's been a lot lost that we used to have that uh, we don't anymore. Um, and I think that that's part of our responsibility and where we come in to this picture as librarians and archivists. So I have to say that, first of all, I started off in I uh, actually started off trying to be a CA, and then I took an anthropology course, and that was it. And so I did my BA in anthropology, and I really started off in museums. And I only wanted to kind of gather the knowledge. And I was challenged by, um, a, by a Wet'suwet'en Dalek librarian named Jean Joseph, who was the title librarian for Delgamoon and the founding library at Wewa Library. And I ended up, as is my thing, I, I ended up uh, volunteering to do a um, a fundraiser, and she challenged me, and she said to me, Camille, you can gather that knowledge as an anthropologist, but how are you going to provide access to it in the future, and how are you going to preserve it? And so that's really why I did my master's in library and archival studies, which when I went and worked with my own community after I graduated, was really what I was trying to do, because I had worked in between my undergrad and my master's in many communities. and. My thing that keeps me awake at night always is that there's boxes of cassettes and videos of people who have now passed on, and uh, they're they're in a different realm now. But we don't have we won't have that knowledge if we're not able to play it. And how do we then be able to transfer that to new medium that keeps on transferring? Well, the only answer that I know of for that. Um, in my limited technological skill sets is, uh, is uh, through archival databases where it's continually being upgraded to new, fo new formats or in cloud computing, which is something that we're using today. But because so much was not known that we had to keep on um, migrating it to newer platforms at the beginning, many, many things were lost. There's been very difficulty getting funding to be able to do this work, and I think all the speakers today have talked about that. But over the last decade, we've seen um, a really big substantive movement, and a lot of that, I believe, is from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I always hold up my hands and say madu, which is thank you, and tell Tan to them for their work and the calls to action, because they really provided the catalyst for change. I often say that, um, before the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action, I was always working with the Canadian Library Association, which is no longer uh, because it wasn't fiscally viable, and the Canadian Federation of Library Associations was founded on the same model as IFLA to become that national voice. But one of the things was, was that it, with CLA, sure, I was the moderator of a section. There was no money. There was no preference given. There was no... Um, a type of um, a voice at that. You didn't have a seat at the table. And that was one of the first things that we did with CFLA, FCAB, was to create an Indigenous representative to the Board of Directors, which was a first for Canada. And I recently, uh, I'm still on the Indigenous Matters Committee, by the way, as past chair and working group lead, but um, I finished being chair uh, at the end of January. And I um, and there's a new Indigenous representative, Stacey Allison Kassan from York University, and a new chair, Colette Portra from uh, from uh, Alberta and for the province of Alberta. And it was really about trying to uh, pull other people into leadership, and the whole models for it was about shared leadership. So I was honored to be able to uh, still play a part in it, but to move on. Um, to allow other people to have that space. So that was one of the things that we did was we created that and immediately um, at the same time kind of thing actually as this was happening maybe about three months before the University of Manitoba had given me permission to ask for and I noticed that you were ill too and I was like oh no. So anyway this has been around for 20 years and it goes um, every two years to a different country and it's called the International Indigenous Librarians Forum. Uh, many other countries, librarians and archivists are kind of together anyway. So this is what we did at the University of Manitoba. And the one thing that happened with this that I will always say is that we had the Maori Stone here in Canada. Uh, and I didn't say that right, sorry. It was created by a, Ma a Maori artist, but it is the Maori Stone. And I always kind of do that wrong because it's together for me. But um, I think... Uh, 
Uh, one of the things that happened with this is that I met people from across the country that then played into being able to pull together to pull into um, to a national uh, committee. And uh, each country gets to hold that Mori stone, which is carved and holds the essence of these gatherings. And there's gifts given to it. You can see it there with the gifts from Regina when it was in Regina in 2005, which was the first time that I went to it, uh, which had a moose hide bag with a Métis sash and obviously the beautiful beading that's on there. And um, that really holds the essence of the gathering from these indigenous um, keepers of knowledge from around um, the globe that have come together to share. And um, uh, part of that was they had asked me to form a committee that would address the calls to action and what we could do. So notably, libraries aren't in those calls to action. Um, and so archives are, so are museums, so are art, so is art, but libraries weren't. And not because we're so good that we didn't make it in there. I think it might have been a little oversight because there's a lot of work to be done in libraries. But, um, but uh, they asked me to do that. So we, we decided that we would um, call it the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And I basically um, uh, pounded the pavement, found, found people from every province and territory. So there was 45 of us from around Canada. Well, I didn't know how to, I was like, you know, I was saying a lot of prayers and I, I, we um, pulled in the elders from the University of Manitoba to lead us in a traditional way. And so uh, Elder Norman Mead and um, Elder Marlene Kakeas were consulted on every step of the way and the report because I wanted to have that leadership and that accountability uh, or else I, I, I wanted to be able to have somebody that I could turn to for wisdom and for that. So they were really generous with their time. And Norman said to me, I said, you know, I don't know how to organize this because there's so much to be done. And basically, Indigenous Library and Archives, we mirror as professionals what people are doing in the mainstream. So we're dealing with, with issues of cataloging, with issues of uh, reference, with issues of uh, accessibility, with preservation. We're doing it all as Indigenous professionals, and there's so few of us. And he said, well, I was going to um, the Association of um, um, tribal archives, libraries, and museums in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was taking a week off to go and visit um, one of my Navajo um, sisters uh, uh, that was a tribal librarian, and so I was going to the canyon for the first time, the big canyon, and um, he said to me, Camille, when you get there, lay down tobacco and ask the creator for uh, what to do. Well, I ended up going to Canyon de Shea first, which I didn't know until um, this last fall, which is where Spider Woman is. And for me, as a Teltan woman, we think about knowledge as more of a spider web rather than a medicine wheel. That's more of um, other cultures' explanation for that. But it was where I was situated at the University of Manitoba. So we used Turtle Lodge, which is um, uh, when we did ILF, um, I co-chaired it with um, uh, Elder Dave Cushane Jr. And so this is from the lodge, the medicine lodge that he had he built in Seguin First Nation, he and his um, community. And uh, so we used their teachings and I uh, divided it. I basically gave down some uh, tobacco and I went back to her place and instead of, um, you know, just hanging out and watching a movie that night, which we had planned to do, I ended up typing out this whole thing and I couldn't leave until I did and I ended up getting to the Grand Canyon only getting one hour of it the next day because I was still busy working on this. I sent it out to the group and what we did is we divided it according to the medicine wheel and I took it back to Norman to be able to, um, I don't think Marlene was in that day, to be able to get permission and he went through the whole of the diagram that we did and we created that for um, the committee to be able to organize our knowledge. Um, so the black team looked at best practices, things we're already doing because we often work in silos and don't share them, which I see happening all over, with whether it's in film or if it's in uh, archives or if it's in libraries. It doesn't matter seem what it is, but we always seem to create our own little groups, but then we don't talk to each other. And so that's part of what we need to do because there's not enough people uh, working in our professions to be able to have to recreate the wheel every time. And I think that um, 
uh, one of the things was we looked at relationships, which is going to be the theme throughout everything that I, I talk about today is talking about, I always feel like I'm like that real estate um, salesman, except I'm talking about relationship, relationships, you got to have relationships, that's the main thing, right? So um, when you think about me, that's kind of one of the things that I really talk about is having a relationship with the community where you're situated on, whose holdings you have in your cultural memory repository or your films or that kind of thing and having a relationship with elders that you're accountable to and with other communities. So I think that it can't be uh, overstressed to how important relationships underline everything that we do and how those can be broken. And that's why I think that I, I, when I think about that, I think about that spider web, how easily those can be broken if we don't look after them and nurture them. With white team, it's about really providing that gap analysis. What calls to action can we do? How can we help support them? How can we look at these um, relationships and create um, uh, an association? How can we envision the future by looking at decolonization of space, of access, classification, indigenous knowledge and protection, outreach and service? So there was 45 people. I think one of whom was, I don't see her, I don't know where Catherine is, there she is, uh, that was well, on the team. Um, so uh, we had these amazing people, and I will tell you that they astounded me with the amount of work that they did and pulled back. We had from September 30th um, until the end of January to pull everything together and to give um, recommendations to the incoming board of directors for how we could proceed remembering that this is about professionals talking to other professionals we weren't consulting with the community and these weren't directed at indigenous communities um, and so we had to come up with a uh, like i said they kind of astounded me we had 83 pages of a report and um, four big databases with one of them actually had three contained in it so um, there was these living databases that we're doing, so we had to figure out a way to make it uh, palatable with people, and we came up with 10 overarching recommendations, which um, were endorsed basically across the country um, uh, by many, many libraries, by all the associations that belong to um, CFLA, FCAB. So one was to create a permanent committee, which is the Indigenous Matters Committee, and we wanted to base it on the same thing. So this is actually the way that it looked um, when I left as chair. And I just want to acknowledge again, Catherine for all her help. She's our co-chair for the logistics team, which is land that keeps us grounded. We have basically, if you can look in the outside of it, it's air, which is communication, which um, I, it, each of these have co-chairs, most of them have co-chairs that are Indigenous and non-Indigenous, although we weren't able to maintain it um, the, in the way that uh, I would have liked it, but that's because of, like I said, we don't have a critical mass of people in this profession yet. And we also put in Indigenous knowledge, language, and cultural memory in the center because we wanted to say that that's what we were really um, working towards. And we had the um, task force on, um, on, um, no, just got it wrong. C TRC task force on uh, archives that was um, that was formed by the Canadian uh, Steering Committee on on archives to address basically uh, call number sixty nine that was directed at archives, which is really where we're coming from. And so there was a few things that are much different here that we look at, um, and there's many things that still need to be worked on with this. But this was kind of the vision that we had at that time. With the red team, it's really future facing. So we're looking at things like we have a joint working group on the classification and subject headings, uh, which is really doing a lot of the heavy lifting for changing, um, trying to work on changing some of the subject heading and the problematic descriptions of communities. This number two was actually, um, it was uh, part of what CF CLA had done for best practices. But it was also, I was fortunate enough to be on the bid committee to bring the TRC archives uh, to form the National Center of, of uh, Truth and Reconciliation, so NCTR, at the University of Manitoba. And these were the five that we had put in that we would do. And I think that they're pretty basic. So if you take something away from this, this is very basic to be able to take away is protecting and preserving Indigenous knowledge, having a, a welcoming place for Indigenous people. 
uh, seeking direction on proper protocol. How do people want their information access? Can you tell stories or, you know, all throughout the year or just when the snow is on the ground? Um, I learned that one the hard way at the University of Manitoba um, because that wasn't my tradition and I had to learn to be able to do that. What's the cultural copyright? And um, the beginning slide, I had a picture of um, uh, Grandma Lizard Zertz, who's now passed, but she gave me my name. Uh, which which is as daughter it means I fly around crazy like and if people know me they know I'm a little bit crazy but they um, I, I fly around crazy like trying to preserve our traditional knowledge and so that was the name given to me when I finished my master's and I also hold a name in Niska but as you've already noticed I don't have a very good grasp of any language sometimes not even English uh, so I can't pronounce that name for you today and I don't want to uh, mess it up. So, um, and it basically meant the same thing. So it was really amazing that I ended up getting my adult name from both of them right after I finished my master's at like 40 years old, because this is my second career, really. <laughs> Actually, it's maybe my third or fourth, but um, we don't want to include dining room waitressing. So, um, uh, you know, I think that those things are really important, right? Like, we have to think about where people come from and when they come into the, into the, the um, where they're coming from with their clan, is that own knowledge, is it gendered knowledge, and how people come. And I think that really where you come from and all those experiences that you have before really form how you access knowledge. So how do we provide that opportunities and training for Indigenous people from all over, even um, uh, people who never thought that they would ever have a chance to go back to university when they were 30, like me. And I think that that's important to remember that not all of us are coming from the same place um, when we come into academia. So number three was talking about the calls to action, how we can implement them. And number four was really about accessibility, and many people know that uh, within our communities there's been a number of um, incredible health um, uh, challenges for many people because of residential school or because of colonization or because of lack of access to potable drinking water, uh, lack of housing, all of these things that are so important or like nutritious food in the communities. If you're paying $60, which I have seen in fly-in, fly-out communities, for a piece of meat that's a steak that's not even enough to feed a family, um, you're paying, you're, you're not able to afford that on a regular basis. And most of the time, those communities are the ones that have had their traditional way of life taken away from them, so they're no longer hunting like my community is. Number five is the big one that I'm going to talk to you about because I think that that's really where a lot of um, our effort and energy is going into right now in our joint uh, working group on classification and um, and subject headings, and it's really about it addressing those structural biases. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one because I think it's really important to realize that integrating Indigenous epistemologies into cataloging practice and knowledge management is so important. In libraries um, and cataloging practices, it really assumes um, that the reader and the person that they're addressing who's going to access that material is white, male, Christian, and heterosexual. Because we know that archives hold what the society values, and we also know that the science of classification um, really is about defining what a culture values as knowledge. So it's really talking about their values. So even when you're coming from a, a, fe a female feminine perspective, you're actually looking at information that's been organized as his story, not her story. Um, and half the time, sometimes you can't even find her story in any of the uh, older archival material because it comes from him. But it is a culture of whiteness. It's not from... Um, it's not coming from a knowledge base that is multicultural like we are in Canada or even um, from a, a one that is actually non-prejudicial. It's actually quite racist when you look at the language. And we all know about Indians of North America and E98 and, and some of the descriptions that are there because we've all had to research underneath them. That's, that's the reason why people know that and that's why it sticks out so much for them. So I believe as an Indigenous um, uh, academic and activist that part of my responsibility is to carve out a place where we can embed those Indigenous values and knowledge um, into the methodologies um, and support Indigenous people 
uh, and nations in their nation building. So part of that is bringing back some of the indigenous ways of thinking um, and responsiveness to indigenous issues, concerns, and to their community. And some of that could be within um, uh, changing the way that we look at things and how we classify that knowledge. So, and this is a real honor for me to be here in this land today to talk about um, the late Brian Deere who just passed away in January. And I was honored enough to spend a little bit of time with him on the phone and an email. And I do have one of the last video recordings that someone did of him and, and, um, and he uh, donated to the International Indigenous Librarians Forum, or ILFAM, <laughs> as we know it. So um, we, um, and it was shown there, so that was one of the last times of his public appearances. And he decided that he was going to create his own system. He basically threw out everything, and he came from an Indigenous worldview, where Indigenous knowledges were were, and viewpoints were valued in knowledge organization, and he created a records management system. So note is not a library system, it's not an archival system. Uh, one of the ladies, um, we call her Kelty McCauley, but that's actually, uh, she was working with him at uh, what later became the Assembly of First Nations, the Native Indian Brotherhood. And uh, she came out to BC and had told Jean Joseph, who is my mentor, um, about this. And they adapted it for uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs um, a library and archives that they were founding. And then, so that was actually adapted for an Indigenous organization, so it came from an Indigenous organization in records management, it was adapted into a library there, but the first time it was adapted into an academic library was for Witwa Library, which is located at the First Nations House of Learning at UBC, and that was around, like it's basically, it's a process of adaptation. Um, and um, it was adapted there, and then it kind of stayed a little bit static after Jean uh, decided to sadly retire. I was actually there working. She had pulled me into working for her. And part of the reason why I ended up working for her after I did that fundraiser was because I had created a records management system for when I was working at Aboriginal Fisheries and Oceans for DFO. And she, she asked me to see it, and I showed her it. And she said, go and look at the uh, Brian Deere. Uh, and I did, and it basically was almost the same. And so to me, what that said was, we come from an indigenous worldview that is unique to its own, but it's very much something that we can share with each other when we're working in English. My dream is always to have people adapt it into their own language and use their own words for it. Um, but it's also about doing that. So it's been adapted a few times. In, in 2012, uh, right after I started at um, um, the um, University of Manitoba, uh, my friend Alyssa Cherry, who we went, we did our, um, our MLIS together, uh, she said, okay, I'm going to adapt this again for the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. I've got a big um, donation, and this is the time. If we're ever going to do an adaptation, we had talked for years about doing a generic one that anybody could take and adapt. And so I said, okay, I will help you with the UVCIC one if we then keep on going and create the generic one. So um, there was a lot, we presented a lot about that and what happened, but it was really adapted really for that library and it was still really BC centric. Um, and then it was also adapted over here in uh, Quebec and I think that's the only uh, place here besides uh, NFB, which I'll get to in a minute. And um, and I was also done in many other First Nations resource centers, remembering that Jean had been like the kind of premier librarian in BC in between being the title librarian who organized the oral histories for uh, Delgamut. And really, we owe her as Canadians, a huge, and Indigenous people, a huge thank you for organizing that. And it became evidence because of her systematic organization of the oral histories, right? So I think that's really important to note. Um, and uh, at that time, um, we had wanted to create it. So we decided, um, we came into fruition that we would just call it because I wanted it to cut across both libraries and archives and museums and records management. 
I didn't want it to be like stuck into one thing, so we called it Indigenous Materials Classification System. And our acting um, university librarian, Lisa O'Hare, actually came up with the name because I'm like, no, it's just an Indigenous classification. She goes, no, you want it to be this. And so she actually named it. So that was really interesting because we didn't want to keep on calling it uh, the Brian Deere because it was so much different than what the original Brian Deere was, but we always make sure that we acknowledge it. And that is honestly about Indigenous citation. When I started to say about my grandma Lizette Zertz who gave me the name, if I came back and told her something that I heard from the land or from other people, she would be like right away, who told you that? And then she would tell me whether they were the legitimate holder of that knowledge. And so we always have to cite where we get our knowledge from. And so I always will be able to um, make sure that people know that it is based on that model. So moving forward, we continue to be able to adapt this. Alyssa Cherry, uh, Kashab Makuda, a librarian from SFU who actually ended up living in Winnipeg for about um, a year because his wife was doing her PhD there. And um, we worked on being able to create space. We changed it from being BC-centric. The nations were reorganized from going from east to west as the sun rises, except it ended up because many in Canada, we have like basically nations that go like this and then other nations that kind of go across like this. So it was kind of like a snake. So kind of what it ended up like. Maybe some of that was because I'd just been at the Serpent Mound in Ohio, I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, that was one of the, I, I've been really fortunate to be able to have been, um, that I've traveled, and it's funny because almost every time I go to a new place, um, the creator shows me a new sacred site to go to, and often they're mounds. So uh, that's very much influential for me because we say that our knowledge sits in the land and where that's where we get our knowledge from and it's in, in, it's in, it, um, it comes to you when you're on the land and so I think that that's really important. Um, and I think that one of the things too is that we wanted to be able to make it so that if you were an uh, coming from um, a community and say you had a whole bunch of things on of course Teltan or uh, Haida or Mohawk that you wouldn't want to just have everything done just put into Mohawk and then by the author. So we wanted to be able to have facets that we could break them out into, whether it was history, culture, language, uh, to be able to actually reflect that so it would still be organized within that. Uh, it is an, a living document, and part of what we're doing now is an Indigenous names that um, uh, work that we're gonna, um, I'm gonna show you in a bit. Uh, but just enough to say that even when we did it for the NFB, which was the next time that we, um, the next time it came out, it had been, uh, at the time when Lisa O'Hare named it was because we uh, implemented it at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation for their library. Uh, then the next time it was really implemented was uh, here in Montreal at the National Film Board. I've been working with um, Catherine, Catherine, and I, I always mess up her last name too because I have really bad French too and English. Um, so, uh, oh, I don't really speak French, so I'll have to just qualify that. But uh, um, I think that um, one of the things was was so cool about the NFB adaptation, which we have, if we have enough time, I'll show you it with Indigenous cinema is that um, it provided an authority list and that the system enabled the resources to have more than one access point. So when you're doing a physical location with a library catalog, you can only have it in one place because the book can only reside or the document can only reside in one place. When it's digital, you can have a number of different access points that you're able to find. So it could be under Indigenous history, it could be under Indigenous art at the same time because you can have a number of different ways to access it. So um, they did an amazing job there, and I think that many of you have heard uh, Catherine and I talk about um, what happened there. But we had a number of different things, so this was really the classification. And then we had a number of different things that we needed to tweak about the classification, but also to work on the subject headings. And so one of the biggest things that we wanted to do is to be able to create this names, named authority list. Um, and it, that's not what we're really going to call it. I think it's just going to be called Indigenous Names. Um, and it probably will be, we're hoping maybe by the time I come back for the research um, forum here at the end of the month, um, uh, that it might be ready. But what it does is it brings the names together and it has the alternate spellings. So even the one that we did at um, NFB is completely changed now because 
we have more accurate spellings, more linguistic spellings, more this than we did then. So as you can see, even just in the last six years, uh, or seven years, I guess since 2012, when we started working on doing these revisions, it has been revised so much, and part of it is to go back to the communities. So we're gonna do a soft launch, um, and then uh, we're working with some other people to compile the list for the communities to send it out to them and say, hey, did we screw up? Did we put this name wrong? Like, we need to actually know from the communities because we, we're taking it from their public-facing websites, but what if they've actually changed it? And when I was working at um, uh, DFO, this was in a time about 30 years ago when um, um, uh, many of the nations were going back to their original names, so we would go from things like that were just... I don't know, port whatever, and then it became, uh, I remember one was Guelsala uh, Nakwado, and I had to learn how to say that one because I knew the chief, and he, he must have made me practice it about 150 times, and nobody could ever spell it or anything, and so I was like really important for us to get that name right, though, because we're doing legal agreements with them, and um, and it was very hard because even Quagulf, which to me is pretty easy to spell, it went back to Quagulf. So how do you get people to be able to do that? But you know how you do it is by putting it into classifications, into subject headings, so they see it, they hear it, and then you can learn the language. And I don't. I hope that works for most people. It just never really worked for me, but I can say a few names. And I think that uh, we had many, many different examples that are here that I always give people for resources. We had an Australian example that the uh, ACETAS protocols were done and endorsed, and because they're a government-funded department, um, they were able to actually make them happen. But I also met at the last DILF, which was in New Zealand in February, um, I met another lady who'd been working with the Dewey Decimal, which is really fascinating, the work that she did, but it's a very localized example. We have the Maori example, uh, where they've actually done their subject headings and they have an OCLC project that they're working on, and so some, that's some of the things that we're moving forward into as well, um, talking with um, uh, the national bodies and trying to make it work. When OCLC came to me the first time and asked me to work with them, I said no. You charge for your information, and we're not allowing that. We want to make sure everything is open source. Anybody can use it because when we bring professionals together from across the country to do this work on volunteer off the side of their desk, it's not something that they're paid to do. Why should we give you the information and then you charge libraries and communities for it? No, sorry. So um, I'm trying to like not be like that, but at the same time, it's like I don't want the information charged for. So what I say is that... When we put it up on the website, then OCLC can copy it just like anybody else. And uh, then if they want to pay an Indigenous person to do the work, that's great. So we actually told them that from um, the International Federation of Library Associations. Um, the U.S. example, you know, the protocols on Native American um, archives, which we had, I think, two Canadians actually helped work on that. Um, they, it took over 10 years for them to get endorsed by the uh, Society of American Archivists. It just happened this summer. And so there's been a lot of work being done in the community and a lot of hard work. And I always say Indigenous people are doing the heavy lifting when it comes to uh, reconciliation. But sometimes that work isn't being acknowledged by um, the professional bodies. And that was part of why this was so important to be able to do. So I'm just going to skip a little bit ahead, but I do want to say that um, we have to make sure that we uh, activate the holistic paradigms because we come from, uh, I always say to people, we never separated out our knowledge into library, archives, museums, or galleries. It was all interconnected to each other, and there's no way of really breaking apart those relationships because they have to be together or else you don't understand the completeness of that knowledge. And there's a real critical need for a community of practice around this work. Um, that we're doing, which is that teaching and sharing of intergenerational knowledge. And by doing that, we need to be able to honor Indigenous voices and relationships and put them forward at the very beginning so that there is that respect. We've had a few things going on across the country which are really important in addition to uh, ATOM, which has been amazing to be able to pull people together from archives, libraries, museums, and really more like our glam. One of them is the Making Meaning that happened uh, last year in February, 
at the University of Alberta had sponsored it. And that was really where we brought about people started to come together and this conversation really started in a, in a good way. We also had In Our Own Words that was uh, supported by York University and Ryerson University. And out of that, uh, we really came up with some good um, uh, listserv to be able to communicate with each other. But I also think it really pulled in a different group of people into being involved in it. Uh, just recently, there was a, an event by uh, UBC and by SFU that was called uh, Sorting Libraries Out, where we gave people the first little sneak peek of that uh, Indigenous Names thing. And I know everybody's been emailing me ever since to get a copy of it, and you all get a copy when it goes on to the website. So, uh, and I'll give you that website in a bit. But I think that what it did is that it provided more opportunities. And it's funny, Canada's a funny place. We really needed to have a conference in in Ontario. You really need to have this one here in Quebec because I don't know why, but we still are very much within our own areas. And some of that is because as Indigenous people, we're very much um, connected to our communities, to our nation and to our land. And I think that that's been some of it. I do want to give a shout out though to some of the work that I've been involved with before which is doing some of the work here. And I don't know why I put it in the next slide, but I did. So this was what I was adding. And uh, Sarah and I were talking about it yesterday. And I guess there's not a lot of people that know that this is going on. But Edith Ann Pagat, who's right there, is um, a professor. And she worked with uh, many of the artists that um, were at Manitou College to bring that back. And that was really a project which is about um, bringing back, and I love the picture on it, so I've, I've always been in love with this little thingy, but anyway, the um, uh, it's really about bringing back the art that happened there at a college that now is no longer in existence, and so she asked me for input when she was doing this work, um, and I worked with her and with, um, uh, and now I just lost his name, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, okay, so there we go. Um, and... Um, it's been interesting to watch that happen, although I can't say that I have much uh, responsibility for it except for the input of the protocols. But I just want to say that I think that this is something that's happening all over, is that people are realizing that we're rapidly losing uh, the information. But it's also about preserving it and organizing it in a respectful way that's honoring Indigenous voices. If we're not preserving it in a good way and people are looking for that knowledge and they're not able to find it, then really why are we preserving it? And Jean Joseph um, did an address to um, that sorting libraries out about the decolonizing classification and Indigenous description. And she talked a little bit about um, working with Brian Deere back in the 70s and 80s and uh, working on subject headings. And she said, you could call it what we call decolonization today, uh, which is true. That's really what it is. But I, I, I like to think of it as, first of all, we have to decolonize, but then we have to indigenize. So it's kind of, you're doing both things because you're teaching people about an indigenous worldview to be able to make um, those changes that we need to do. Um, and I think that for many years, we didn't have a critical mass. We're starting to get more people that have been involved in our professional areas. Um, but I remember when I moved to the unit, to um, took, accepted the position at the University of Manitoba, and I remember some of the others say, well, why don't we have an indigenous person from here? And I said, yeah, why don't you? Like, you know what? They have to go to do their masters too if they want to work in an academic library. And it's not, I didn't want to leave my community for six years. I never wanted to leave my community. In fact, I went back there right after I finished my masters because our way of life is very much closer to the land. Uh, and that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about and really why I'm doing a PhD is to be able to give people that ability without having to leave their community because our real culture keepers and knowledge keepers are still residing in our community that are passing down the language. But they're often in fa sandwich generations where they can't uh, leave because they're caring for elderly and they have young people. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of, um, uh, you know, obstacles, but I believe that we're strong enough to overcome them. And I believe that currently we have enough people working in this field to be able to help educate other people and to work with our allies. And I always acknowledge my allies and I, I raise my hands to them and say, Madhu, because without them, I honestly wouldn't be here today. I don't think that I would be able to be doing the work that I'm doing without allies uh, that work with me. And um, 
I believe that one of the things that's happening is that we did do a whole bunch of changes back 30 years ago. And she talked about the fact that every time she saw something uh, within um, within the library that she would talk about, um, she would talk about uh, changing it during that time. And perhaps she said that our varying electronic means and differing technology proficiencies means that we haven't been able to keep this across the worldview uh, to go across to every single one of the databases in the spirituality and languages. But the vitalest thing is our names, which she didn't even know I was working with that I'd been co-chairing along with Alyssa Cherry and, um, and uh, Stacey Allison Kassan and Tim McKnight. Um, to do this indigenous database. Um, we've been working on the working group there, of which Catherine's a, a vital part of it as well. And I think that um, when she said this about this, that she had changed many of them as the new technology came. So with libraries, just like with anything else, we get a new system. Some of those localized changes that we've made then don't get transferred into the new system. And so part of it is about having a central place where we can still download that information from. Um, and I think that one of the things that I think that is so important that she said, and I'm just gonna skip up to that, is one of the most basic acts of respect and recognition for a human being is to know you by your name. And if your name was Bill and I start calling you Sue all the time, I just say that because that Johnny Cash song, but, uh, and I start calling you Sue all the time, you wouldn't like that very much because he was mad at his dad if you remember the song. But let our people be known by our names. I think it's so important for us to be able to do that. One of the things that I didn't even know that I was working on the same um, shirk, um research with um, uh, Jason is that we're both on the counter uh, archives counter archives which we have Santa here today from and one of the things that we're trying to do is to work on um, creating those um, an authority list within that that's more subject heading so it's not just indigenous people it might be related to LGBTQIQ it might be related to genders or sexuality but we want to start getting um, together a list that's not just about Indigenous people, but addressing these problematic issues that cut across um, uh, race and it cuts across ethnicity so that we're being much more respectful. So that's a little bit about that. I think the other um, ones that we've talked about that we're not really addressing here today is decolonizing libraries and space. Part of that is through uh, space planning, interior design, art installations, uh, doing territorial acknowledgments. And then um, uh, enhancing the opportunities for Indigenous people in, as professionals, but also doing cross-cultural appropriate um, uh, training right now. We developed a, um, a, in my new position as learning and organizational development librarian for all, all the libraries, uh, we developed an Indigenous um, uh, cultural competency training, which is a blended uh, learning, which is based on having online from uh, the University of um, Alberta's uh, Indigenous Canada MOOC. Then we have in-person meetings every week that are called Meaningful Dialogues. And on May 1st, we're going out to Turtle Lodge. So we bring in, that's we just ran our first one. And uh, we'll be doing a spring and summer session as well. But it's important to remember that people who've been in the profession for a while also need to have that kind of training, not just our new professionals. This one's a big one, and because we don't, we're in a lack of time, we do have a statement that we put out. So I've been on the copyright committee now since its inception with um, uh, CFLA, FCAB, but it's embedding that cultural competency um, uh, into um, working with Indigenous knowledge. And so I was lucky enough to be um, present to the standing committee this last year when it came through Winnipeg as just as myself, which was weird, um, as a PhD student in anthropology. So that was nice, but because we'd already done the statement, so I couldn't present that twice. But remembering, and I always go back to Verna Kirkness's and um, our um, Barnhart, who I didn't know very well, but Verna was actually our founder at the First Nations House of Learning at UBC. And I was always scared of her too, because she was a little intimidating But uh, when I was a student. But to remember those relationship um, protocols of uh, respect, relevance, recipro reciprocity, and uh, re re um, responsibility. And I think uh, one of the things that I wanted to say too is that um, with the TRC calls to action, one of the things is the right to know. 
So with indigenous people, we need to allow them to have access into our existing archives and to be able to reactivate that knowledge. And there's a number of different, um, within each one of the um, uh, recommendations, there'll be granular recommendations, that's why it's 83 pages. So there's a number of different things that talk about doing citations. If you get a chance, look at uh, Dr. Greg Young Ng's um, uh, uh, book on um, Indigenous styles. No, I just lost the title of it. We just talked about it yesterday too. Elements of style, thank you. And uh, this is where you can find the knowledge copyright statement, which is basic because if we look at protocols across the country, they're going to be different in every way. But the basic statement is that Canadian Copyright Act needs to respect, affirm, and recognize Indigenous ownership of their traditional and living respective knowledges. And that's because of the different protocols that even I talked about, that you can only tell st uh, stories when the snow is on the ground. Where I live, that's not my tradition. But in my tradition, we have different clan knowledge that we can only tell if we belong to that clan. There's gendered knowledge. So we have to remember that it's going to be different, and it's about creating that relationship with that Indigenous community to see how they want their knowledge and their tangible and intangible uh, materials um, kept. So the other thing is just to create that kind of synergy between the communities with the best practices and to keep updating that. And I believe that there was a survey that went out, um, not as involved anymore as I used to be when I was chair, but I think it went out and it's still open to be answered for people to say, hey, we did this and then we can show them off and uh, give them a pat on the back. And the last thing is to create um, uh, an Indigenous association. And that's where we want to, and I believe that the path to reconciliation is our relationships with each other, with the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community and moving forward. And as I do on every um, time I speak, I always invite people uh, to come and stand beside me on this path and walk towards reconciliation. I say that I will not um, privilege my knowledge above your knowledge, so I won't walk in front of you, but I won't walk behind you either, and I won't have Western knowledge privileged above Indigenous knowledge, but I ask you to walk beside me as an equal partner because we have to create a new Canada for future generations because we can see already uh, that all the things that are going on in the world um, south of the border and even happening here in Canada now that we have to be allies and we have to work together to create that future for Canada. So we've been trying to create this um, NICLA Indigenous uh, Knowledge and Language Alliance. You can look it up on the, um, on the internet and um, you can find it there. We had our initial meeting and part of the reason why it's in a tree is because, and it's not my drawing because I'm not an artist, so maybe I can talk to one of you guys later, but uh, uh, one of the things is, is we want to stay rooted and grounded in our cultural memory, our language, and our knowledge, indigenous knowledge, but we have many branches uh, whether they're library, archives, museums, gallery, it's kind of uh, set up to be like an indigenous glam. And what I've noticed in the last year is that many more associations are forming. But part of that is the divide and conquer that we know that the government does. So we want to be able to call ourselves an alliance so we work with everybody rather than an association which is more exclusive rather than inclusive. So that's kind of where we've been going towards. And I think I'm going to leave it there. And I uh, just say, uh, Madhu, thank you for your time and attention. I know it's late. I even had to do a little wake up chocolate myself. So um, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions later.